talk about nuclear non-proliferation policy in Northeast Asia. And our first speaker uh, is Mark Fitzpatrick on my right here. Um, and it's certainly not the first time he's very kindly agreed to speak for us. Um, he's Executive Director of the America's Office of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. So having previously been based in London, this time he's flown over from the States, especially for this. Um, and uh, before he joined IISS in 2005, he spent 26 years in the US State Department, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Non-Proliferation, brackets acting. Um, and he's written a number of books on this kind of subject, one of which you can see uh, up on the screen behind him. I think this must be the latest one, yes. Asia's Latent Nuclear Powers. And as you see, it's also been translated into Japanese and published in Japanese. So over to you, Mark. Uh, thanks very much, Jason, for the introduction. Um, thank you to Daiwa Foundation for rolling out the green carpet for us uh, tonight. Uh, I was very delighted when uh, the Daiwa Foundation asked me to come and uh, speak uh, with uh, Rebecca Johnson, uh, an old friend from the days that I was in uh, London, and uh, to speak uh, uh, in this uh, series that Daiwa Foundation is uh, putting together on, on uh, issues of history. We're going to talk about history uh, and current policy, and uh, this is a uh, an issue where history, uh, I would say, really matters. That uh, matters to the present. I suspect that um, in talks about history, I wouldn't be the first one to quote Mark Twain, who said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. <laughs> and in the case of uh, nuclear proliferation in uh, Northeast Asia, the topic of uh, today's session. Uh, there are some developments in the past that uh, rhyme in some ways with uh, possible developments of the present. There are three uh, nuclear weapon states in Northeast Asia, four if you count the United States, which has submarines patrolling somewhere that are nuclear armed and probably are in Asian waters uh, often enough. And there has been a possibility that the four would uh, become seven. That there are three other states in Northeast Asia that have pursued uh, nuclear weapon development programs at one point or another. <laughs> now, one of them was Imperial Japan, which is a very different uh, was a very different uh, country uh, to the one uh, that is uh, the current uh, Japan. But the current Japan has also thought about nuclear weapons. They've never had a nuclear weapons development program since the end of the Second World War. But the Japanese government has thought about it, they've weighed, they've decided not to do it, but they've also pursued nuclear technologies for civilian purposes that, because of the nature of the atom, also have an application for weapons purposes. I argue in my book that Japan is not just a latent nuclear power, latency meaning a capability, but that Japan is a quasi-hedging uh, nuclear power, that Japan has uh, a hedging strategy uh, not to have a nuclear weapon, not to develop a nuclear weapon today, but to have technologies that, if needed for a rainy day, they might be able to use them. The other two uh, countries that I examined in my book and I'll talk about tonight, South Korea and uh, <coughs> Well, Taiwan, I'm not supposed to call it a country if anybody from the embassy of China is here. I'm supposed to call it a government or a, an entity or let's call it a democracy uh, today. Um, <laughs> when it pursued uh, nuclear weapons in the 1970s and 1980s, it wasn't a democracy. It was an authoritarian country. It was a very different uh, country, that, a very different uh, entity than it is today. Uh, similarly, North, uh, similarly, South Korea when it pursued nuclear weapons in the 1970s. It was an authoritarian state, uh, more or less a dictatorship. It's, it's uh, n obviously not that today. So uh, very different states today. But the reasons that, um, that Japan had a hedging, has had a hedging strategy, the reasons that South Korea and Taiwan uh, pursued nuclear weapons in the past were to meet changing security needs, uh, changing security situations that made them think that maybe they needed nuclear weapons uh, to protect <coughs> themselves. And that was often combined with a fear of the loss 
of America's security umbrella, the um, the you know nu the sometimes called the um, nuclear umbrella. I don't like to call it a nuclear umbrella because I think America's security commitment is much more than a secure than a nuclear umbrella. And in fact, uh, the nuclear part of it is the least credible uh, part of the security that the United States uh, helps provide to Japan and uh, and South Korea. But there were times when. America's um, partners in East Asia feared that America was becoming isolationist, that it was uh, withdrawing its uh, security commitments, and those were times when the countries uh, either went down a nuclear hedging strategy or actually went down a nuclear weapons uh, development. And that's the relationship to the present, because security situations have changed for countries, states in Northeast Asia, um, with the obvious uh, case being the North Korea nuclear weapons development. Uh, we may see a sixth nuclear weapons test by North Korea in the near future. And with China's increasing um, military might, both in conventional and uh, in the nuclear sector. It, it gives uh, the other um, governments in Northeast Asia a reason to reassess their security needs. Now, whenever they've reassessed them, ever since uh, 1980, they've, they've, 1980, 1990 in Taiwan's case, they realized that relying on the U.S. security commitment was their best uh, way forward. But what if that security guarantee were to be uh, questioned? And there are some reasons why it may be questioned today. Uh, Donald Trump on the campaign trail a year ago, three times said that it might be okay for Japan and America's ally, other allies to seek nuclear weapons of them, for themselves. Three times he said that, three different interviews. They're on tape, it's undeniable what he said. He later said he never said it. <laughs> no, look, don't laugh, don't laugh. This is a good thing. It's a good thing he said he never said it. Because when he says he never said it, it means, mm -hmm. whatever I said, ignore that, forget it, I don't mean it, I didn't mean it, it was just a... I just used that to put pressure on them so they'd pay more for their defense, so they would uh, realize the importance of the United States. I didn't mean what I said. Uh, so that's good. I don't think the United States is going to pursue uh, a policy of encouraging its uh, partners to go down the nuclear weapons path. But every once in a while you hear something that makes you think, oh, why did he say that? On March 17th, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was asked about uh, nuclearization in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the questioner from Fox News was asking him about uh, should South Korea, you know, what do you think about South Korea going nuclear? Because there's this mood in South Korea that maybe they need to. 60% of the people in South Korea, when you ask them, should South Korea have nuclear weapons? 60% say, yeah, we should have them. Now, that's not the government's policy, not at all. They're very committed to the NPT. But there's this mood in South Korea. So Rex Tillerson was asked, and he said, all options remain on the table. Well, that's kind of a standard answer you give when you're asked about military options. But this wasn't a military option. This was nuclearization of an American partner, an ally. And all options on the table, did he mean that, you know, it's one of the things that is in the policy review that the United States is going through right now on North Korea policy? I sure hope not, because every government official I've, I've talked to in the United States, every military uh, planning officer, says this would be this would this would be a bad 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 idea um, for to encourage any American ally to go down a nuclear uh, weapons path uh, would have so many drawbacks uh, not the least of which would be creating a nuclear domino effect you know because if you encourage say South Korea to go nuclear in response to North Korea um, that puts a certain pressure on other countries, a certain incentive to maybe think that they need it too. Now, I don't say that because South Korea were to go nuclear, Japan would. Uh, Japan is a pretty strongly uh, anti-nuclear country. The sentiment is, is really pretty strong. But it would be a new development they would have to take into consideration. I think if it was the reverse, if Japan were to go nuclear, I think it's absolutely certain that South Korea would think that they needed to. The anti-nuclear... Um, sentiment among the people is not as strong as it is in Japan. In fact, um, many South Koreans think that as actually nuclear weapons is what liberated them. They think that the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended the war and ended uh, 
uh, Korea's um, uh, colonial uh, period under Japan. I don't think actually that's what ended the war. I think it was the Soviet entry. Um, but there was a factor. Anyways, the South Korean sentiment toward uh, nuclear weapons uh, is not as uh, strongly anti-nuclear as is Japan. And the you know Koreans have a history of fearing a larger neighbor, Japan. And so I think they would if Japan didn't. And then if such stalwart adherence to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty were to seek nuclear weapons, uh, that's pretty much the end of the treaty, I think. I think in, in, in Northeast Asia, Taiwan would um, also think that it needed it, and also around the world, countries like Saudi Arabia and Brazil, and, and uh, who knows, um, would also uh, uh, question whether the NPT was really um, uh, be all and end all of nuclear policy. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the of the three uh, governments here that pursued uh, nuclear weapons. So in the case of Japan, they did not have a dedicated nuclear weapons program after the war. They did from 1941 to 45, um, they pursued uranium enrichment. Both the Navy and the Imperial Army had their own enrichment programs. One was diffusion, one was um, centri gas centrifuge. Uh, they didn't get very far. They didn't have the, the resources. The government had, had other needs uh, for um, resources. But they certainly were trying to get nuclear weapons, and they failed. After the war, there was some talk. Uh, the United States thought it might be a good idea to have nuclear weapons in Japan the way the United States had them in Germany. They kind of encouraged Japan for a little bit, but and some Japanese post-war um, prime ministers were interested in it, uh, memoirs of, of Kishi uh, and others, but they soon um, decided, no, that's, that's not uh, the best way forward. And instead they had this uh, nuclear hedging strategy of having nuclear technologies that were for civilian purposes, but if needed, as I say, could be for weapons purposes. And you even have some people like former Defense Minister uh, Ishiba saying um, that um, even after um, uh, Fukushima uh, disaster, that Japan should retain a nuclear technology because it was a technological deterrent or technology deterrent. Um, Japan has um, a lot of the wherewithal for nuclear weapons. Uh, because of its civilian program. It's got the most robust nuclear energy program in um, the world outside of the nuclear armed states. It has both plutonium reprocessing and uh, uranium enrichment, the two paths to a bomb. They're both for civilian purposes. Um, South Koreans wish they had the same technologies. They say, well, if Japan was allowed to have plutonium reprocessing, why not uh, South Korea? My answer is, well, it's partly a historical accident. Japan got Plutonium reprocessing was allowed to have it before the United States turned against reprocessing. Reprocessing used to be what, um, in the early, day, early days of the nuclear age, people thought this was a way to conserve uranium. Uh, you know, you would have a closed fuel cycle. You'd uh, use the plutonium to, uh, um, to run your reactors. Um, so the United States pursued this. But when, when India uh, used plutonium for nuclear weapons purposes, the United States realized it's a real proliferation threat. So tried to stop the pursuit of plutonium, tried to persuade Japan to stop um, plutonium uh, reprocessing, but Japan had already invested a lot of money in it, and Japan said that as a condition for signing the NPT, they wanted to have the right to pursue these uh, tech, uh, technologies. So the United States uh, went in, and then under Ronald Reagan, um, Japan's anti-communist stance was more important than uh, proliferation, so what had been a smaller program allowed it by Carter became a larger program allowed by Reagan. Uh, now, in South Korea, as I said, they wanted the same. They want. They, they wanted for a long time the technologies that Japan has been allowed. And the reason that the United States can allow or disallow is because the nuclear um, fuel that both countries use and the nuclear reactors that they use uh, has technology and uranium that was supplied by the United States, over which the United States retains a legal um, provision that it can't be used for any purposes other than what the United States allows. And the United States, in the case of Japan, allowed it to be used for reprocessing. In the case of uh, South Korea, it didn't. Back in um, the 19, uh, early 1970, it was, South Korea actually embarked on a nuclear weapons program. This came right after the um, Nixon um, Guam Doctrine. Any historians here remember the Guam Doctrine in the United States? Richard Nixon said, 
you know, America's allies should be primarily responsible for their own defense. Um, it was a kind of a stepping back, uh, a bit of an isolationist move. That's a large part of what sparked uh, Park Chung-hee to decide he needed nuclear weapons. There were also the North Korean provocations that happened shortly before that. Um, so, uh, North Korea shot down an American uh, plane. Uh, they uh, tried to assassinate Park Chung-hee himself. And Park didn't think that America's response to these um, provocations was strong enough. So they embarked on a nuclear weapons path, trying to get plutonium uh, reprocessing technology from France and Austria and some other countries. CIA found out about it, and uh, the United States stopped them. Uh, Park Chung-hee uh, was told by uh, Henry Kissinger, if you don't stop your weapons development program, say goodbye to the American Security Alliance. You can't have them both. So Park Chung-hee uh, acquiesced in that and gave up the program. A couple years later, in 1978, uh, 77, he started it again because Jimmy Carter was elected president. Jimmy Carter, uh, during the election campaign, had said he wanted to pull U.S. forces out of South Korea. Another kind of case of stepping back isolationism. And um, Park Chung-hee thought, well, if America's uh, leaving, we've got to protect ourselves. So he, again, pursued uh, plutonium reprocessing. Again, the United States found out about it. Um, Park Chung-hee uh, was assassinated. His successor, Chun Du Hwan, needed the legitimacy of American uh, relationship, friendship, and so uh, he gave up the program. In Taiwan, they started a nuclear weapons program back in 1964 when China tested a nuclear weapon for the first time. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek thought that he needed it too. And one interesting uh, anecdote about um, the re Republic of China's quest for nuclear weapons is they thought it was totally legitimate under the NPT. Remember the NPT, uh, in 1968, it allows um, countries that had tested a, a nuclear weapon before uh, 1964, Eight? Eight. before 68, before 68, to be allowed to uh, maintain them. And, and the Republic of China said, well, we tested in 1964, because we're China. Right? I mean, we're, they claimed all in China. We're China. Uh, well, anyway, the United States wasn't so happy when they found out about uh, Taiwan's quest for nuclear weapons. Put a lot of pressure. Took a long time to uh, get the uh, uh, Taiwanese to stop their nuclear weapons pursuit. They just you know, sort of stopped it once and started it again. And then the CIA had a mole in the, um, in the nuclear energy program. Uh, the nuclear weapons program of, of the Republic of China, and the mole um, um, uh, defected to the United States, and and uh, and that was it. Uh, you know, the game was up. Um, and then, um, just about the same time, uh, Taiwan went through a democratic uh, democratization. Uh, the son of Chiang Kai-shek uh, died. It was replaced by um, the um, Tang. It's in my notes somewhere. Uh, anyway, uh, democracy started to bloom in in, in Taiwan and uh, became a much more open society, and they uh, agreed uh, to give up nuclear weapons. They haven't pursued it since. Every once in a while in Taiwan, you, you know, somebody will say, well, we need nuclear weapons, but I haven't seen anybody say that for about 11 years now when I, I did my uh, research. I found one guy who was involved in the program back then saying to me, oh, shucks, I wish we had stuck with it. But um, I think you know, most Taiwanese realized that if they had stuck with it, it would have been uh, the um, catalyst uh, for um, you know, the mainland uh, to um, to just give up this pretense of uh, of Taiwan as a um, kind of a separate system, and, uh, and we would have had a war over it. It's one. It, I mean, China. Beijing says that explicitly. If uh, if Taiwan were to seek nuclear weapons, it would be it would be war. Um, Japan is. Uh, I've talked to many Japanese about what would be the conditions that might make them rethink. You know, the Japanese have, have had many studies over the years about whether they needed nuclear weapons. You can go back and look at these studies. Every time they studied it, they concluded oh, it would cost so much, and uh, it would be uh, such a security nightmare for us, because you know, when we we'd be very vulnerable when we started uh, down a path of nuclear weapons. We wouldn't have submarines that could give us a second strike capability. We wouldn't have any place to test the weapons. Um, so they've always uh, decided that was a bad idea. But as I say, when security circumstances have changed, they, they've uh, looked at it again. And I've talked to some Japanese who have said, you know, when, when they hear Trump speak, they really wonder if they maybe um, what they should do about this. I'm very glad that uh, Secretary of Defense 
uh, James Mattis, when he went to uh, Northeast Asia in January, said all the right things about honoring America's security commitments. When uh, Prime Minister Abe visited um, Trump um, and had that 19-second uh, handshake that went on forever, um, Trump said all the right things about we're with you 100% uh, backing. This was right after North, oh, in North Korea, you know, they, they, they launched the missile and uh, Trump gave the, all the reassurances uh, to, to Abe. I wish he had just said, and South Korea, when he said, we're with you 100%. He kind of forgot that South Korea was also uh, in the hair uh, trigger of, uh, of North Korea and needed some reassurance. Because it's in South Korea. If there's going to be any of these um, governments that go down a nuclear weapons path, it's going to be South Korea, I'm afraid, because of the attitudes toward um, nuclear weapons and because they really do face this threat. And they feel the United States hasn't protected them from the, uh, from the North Korean threat. <coughs> Um, I don't think South Korea is going to get nuclear weapons because it would be such a, a disaster economically. The United States would stop selling fuel for um, South Korea's uh, nuclear power plants, and uh, which provide 20% uh, or more of South Korea's electricity. They would all go cold. Um, South Korea would face other sanctions. They would be vulnerable to North Korea during a period of time before they actually were able to get the weapons. The United States security commitment uh, would be in risk uh, China and Russia would both have reason to target the nuclear weapons uh, facilities, uh, and I can come up with uh, dozens of other reasons why I don't think they will. But um, it kind of depends on the U.S. security commitment, and uh, I hope that, uh, that President Trump uh, keeps saying the right things and Rex Tillerson stops repeating all options are on the table. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mark. So our second speaker is Dr. Rebecca Johnson. Um, she is director of the Acronym Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy. And she has taken part, it says here, in every NPT conference from 1994 to 2015. So, uh, that's a lot of conferences. And, I didn't and, have a life. <laughs> and she also has published a number of books, but I don't think we've got any screenshots of them here. So, so we can turn my yeah, look them up on, on uh, Google. And I think while Mark has concentrating more on the historical background, uh, Rebecca's going to focus more on what's going on now. And as you know, quite a lot is going on right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. And um, thank you very much to the Daiwa Foundation for inviting me and to Mark for suggesting this. Um, and it's a pleasure to see you back in London. Now, as Jason said, I'm mostly going to focus on what is happening now because there are some very, very interesting challenges, uh, some scary but definitely big challenges facing us. Um, <clears throat> but I just want to start because we're here and it's a beautiful day and we're right on the edge of Regent's Park with a tiny bit of personal history because there is a connection. Uh, in 1978, I was a gardener in Regent's Park <laughs> saving money to be able to go to Japan. I spent two years in Japan teaching, and I noticed you share a building with the Japan Society, and I was one of their guinea pig students for their teacher training program, and I have to say their teachers were excellent because I, I learned really fast uh, to be able to get by in Japan and decided to completely change what I'd been planning to do as a young scientist in my life. I was really only going to Japan to spend some time with members of my family that were there, my sister and her, her husband and children. Um, and, um, but, but decided that I was going to come back and do a master's degree and intended, in fact, to do a PhD, for which I got accepted, but my life ch took another change at that point. Um, and did my master's degree on uh, security relations in the um, 20th, 20th century, it was at that time, we're talking about the early 80s. Um, and my thesis was on the US-Soviet uh, rivalry over the reconstruction of Japan from 1945 to 51. So that was a very, very interesting period because it involved looking at the decision-making that led to the dropping of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs but also that led to you know, the ending of the war. And like Mark, I'm somewhat more of the view that uh, it was the prospect of Russia coming into, or Soviet Union coming into the war, 
in August of 1945. That precipitated the use of the nuclear weapons and indeed the end of the uh, of of the um, of the war, uh, and not the use of the weapons that resulted in the end of the war. And I'm pleased to say that more and more scholars have taken that view um, over time. But so <clears throat> this is is sort of where some of my background has been and. Therefore, I've ha carried on having a very particular kind of interest in Northeast Asia, in that part of the world. I've even taken the Trans-Siberian across various parts of it and all the way back to London. So one of the challenges that we have now, because Mark has kind of set us up, well, a huge challenge we see here is, is changes in, 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 in leadership that perhaps have been very unexpected. We're here, meeting here on the threshold of, uh, I can I find it difficult even calling him still President Donald Trump, <laughs> meeting with the Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping in Florida. Uh, we have the South Korean President Park having been impeached, and you know nobody's quite <coughs> sure what is going to be happening, how that is going to stabilize or not, as the case may be. Um, just last week, the uh, THAAD, the um, uh, High Altitude Theater, sorry, High Altitude Aerial uh, Defense System, has pretty much been um, uh, uh, established, uh, and China is extremely unhappy with that. And you wonder how much that's going to be discussed, or even what Trump might or might not know about that. Uh, probably not a great deal. <laughs> um, but Trump is obviously going there wanting to put pressure on China with regard to North Korea. And here we have Kim Jong-un who seems to be now fairly much with his feet under the table, but very vulnerable and clearly feeling very vulnerable. I mean, you're, you know, it, it isn't a confident uh, leader who has regime stability, who fires off the kind of nuclear tests and missile tests and uh, certainly appears to be behind the assassination of his own uh, brother. These are the acts of somebody who is scared and weak. And, uh, and so that, that carries its own um, issues. Japan has many aspects of stability that are enviable in that region. But on nuclear issues, and we're here to talk about non-proliferation, uh, we have to talk both about the nuclear fuel cycle issues and the nuclear weapons issues. And Japan is looking even much shakier when we look at both of those. Since the, <coughs> the, the uh, horrendous earthquake, um, followed by the Fukushima disaster of March 2011, we see uh, an upsurge of rejection for the so-called atoms for peace aspect to uh, nuclear technology, where before, as Mark said, there has always been a, a, a strong push for uh, nuclear disarmament, at least in civil society. And traditionally, every August the 6th, every August 9th, half of the Tokyo uh, political elite decamps <coughs> down to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I've been down to those, those ceremonies several times to pay their respects. Um, you know, to the, the, the you know, hundreds of thousands who were killed in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and to kind of reaffirm a kind of non, uh, sorry, a kind of nuclear disarmament credential, while nevertheless, of course, participating and continuing to participate very actively in a US-Japanese security alliance that is a nuclear umbrella alliance, although I have to say I agree again with Mark that we need to start thinking about it very differently because it is going to come under some changes. But it is a nuclear alliance, but does it have to be? Uh, Mark expressed some skepticism that, that the nuclear component of the alliance is probably the least credible, and I totally agree. But it is clung to, and it is a lever for certain kinds of dilemmas that Jap Japan continues to face. Now, I was in New York just last week, and I was at the United Nations, and I was there for the groundbreaking 
start to UN negotiations on a, a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons leading to their total elimination. Now, I say it in those awkward terms because that's a quote from the resolution that was passed first by the UN First Committee last year in October and then um, by uh, the UN General Assembly in December, on December 23rd, which agreed, having had a whole process, pretty much leading from the 2010, or leading out of the 2010 NPT Review Conference, um, which was one of the uh, successful ones in recent years. But in that uh, conference, there was more of a push to talk about the use of nuclear weapons and to identify both the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons or any nuclear detonation, and also to argue, and this was adopted as part of the consensus agreements of the NPT states parties at the 2010 review conference, to argue or to underscore that any use of nuclear weapons had to be consistent with international humanitarian law. And at the same time, you got quite a number of states and, um, and, and civil society and some international organizations that looked at the situation of nuclear doctrines and potential nuclear uses and actually said, although the International Court of Justice in 1996 allowed for the possibility of use in extreme circumstances when the uh, survival of the state was at stake. The truth of the matter is that it would be difficult to identify a use that would not violate international humanitarian law, even in a context where it would be argued that things had reached such an impasse that the survival of the state was a danger, partly because nuclear deterrence by and large relies on a retaliation. And retaliation isn't um, legitimate under international humanitarian law because the, the, the you know, and I, I don't I need to go into issues around proportionality, the fact that nuclear weapons cannot distinguish between uh, civilians, uh, combatants and non-combatants, that the primary targets that are targeted, that, 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 you know, since the 50s have been the primary targets for nuclear weapons are actually cities what's known as counter-value targets, rather than solely some kind of a military target. And again, that has to do with the, na the changing nature of nuclear deterrence doctrines um, over the years. So <clears throat> what we had was a process then leading out of 2010, out of the NPT in 2010, that got picked up first by Norway, which held um, a humanitarian, was known as a humanitarian conference. It was the first international conference on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons, held in Oslo in um, March 2013. That was followed by statements that started to go into NPT, uh, what are known as PREPCOMs. They're the meetings that lead up to the five yearly review conferences that were being signed by two thirds of the NPT states. Um, and then Mexico picked up the baton and they held the second international uh, conference on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons uh, and they held that in Nayarit in Mexico in uh, February, anniversary of the Tlatelolco Treaty, if any of you know the first prohibition treaty, regional nuclear weapon free zone treaty that was um, established um, uh, in 1967. Uh, and so after Mexico, uh, Austria picked up the baton and the Vienna conference was held in December of, of 2014. By this time, we had something like 158 states. And in fact, in Vienna, the US and the UK, as well as India and Pakistan participated. China participated in all of them, but not officially, which is something that we perhaps are rather familiar with. They sent a fairly junior person who didn't sit behind the nameplate, but was nevertheless there and reporting on it. Um, but Russia and France did not attend Vienna. 
But out of that came something called the Humanitarian Pledge, which started off as the Austrian Pledge, was put down at the NPT in 2015. So we've now had five years of this humanitarian process connecting and kind of intersecting, a bit like a DNA molecule, um, with, the, um, with the NPT review process. So 2015, we had the Austrian pledge turned into an international pledge and, and basically signed up to by the majority of NPT uh, states. But unfortunately, the NPT review conference of 2015 failed. It failed principally on the issue of the Middle East, where there had been a promise for it to have a conference to get a, weapon, uh, a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. It was supposed to be held in 2012, but it didn't take place. And then there were a lot of recriminations. And by the time we got to the 2015 review conference, there was so much hostility back, going back and forth that essentially the meeting failed to adopt any kind of consensus agreement. At that point, the uh, core group working for the um, humanitarian process became more explicit that in their view they had heard from the Red Cross and from scientists, from Chatham House, from um, uh, uh, you know, climate scientists, a range of doctors, they'd heard from the Hibaksha, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they'd heard from uh, non-proliferation experts, and they basically had concluded that nuclear weapons, the risks and dangers associated with nuclear weapons were so much worse, they had been actually underestimated, perhaps um, in the same ways that the dangers from nuclear power generation had been un underestimated. Uh, you can calculate for certain sizes of earthquakes and certain problems and certain mistakes, but if you get the perfect storm, if the tsunami is too high, if somebody drops a wrench down um, uh, a missile silo and it hits the wrong place at the wrong time and sets a chain of events, if uh, uh, airmen are not aware that they actually have uh, half a dozen crew, nuclear armed cruise missiles attached to their plane and they start flying it back and forth and then leaving it on the apron without any security. These kinds of mistakes, miscalculations, how many of us have had computers go wrong? This is all now part of what nuclear deployment depends on and yet it is actually highly prone to error and, and, and dangers. So as a result of that, a larger group of states came together and last year, under UN auspices, held meetings in Geneva called an open-ended working group and came to the conclusion that we heard enough from the experts and what was needed was a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons and lead to their elimination. And part of that was the recognition that the NPT regime just wasn't working. So <clears throat> that met all last uh, year, and then a resolution went to the UN uh, First Committee, and then, as I said, to the Gen General Assembly, that nuclear, uh, that the, the UN would uh, host, would commence, under its General Assembly auspices, multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations for a nuclear prohibition treaty that will be a step towards their total elimination. Now, why I've gone into detail about that is because in this country, you, pro you, you hardly hear about it in the, in the newspaper. How many of you were aware before last week that the UN was even thinking about, let, let alone having, these kinds of multilateral uh, disarmament negotiations. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because this is actually shocking given how long the process has been from 2010, but it's been a process of denial. But it has particular impact then also for, um, for the region. So um, the nuclear non-proliferation regime you know, North, uh, North Korea withdrew, it was a signatory to the NPT, it withdrew in 2003. 
and the non-proliferation regime proved unable to really tackle um, how to deal with a state withdrawing. And there were, there was the kind of administrative things of kind of leaving their N NPT nameplate, you know, under the seat of the chair of these various NPT meetings that I've attended assiduously. But actually, in reality, North Korea withdrew from the NPT and then started doing nuclear tests, started parading its nuclear capabilities, started trying to demonstrate its nuclear capabilities for the purposes of what it considers, or the regime considers to be <coughs> deterrence. And the NPT regime has seemed to be helpless. So that's problem number one. Then we see um, the, the, you know, the new kind of what well, things like FAG, the missile defense shields coming up. But of course, they're also prone to getting it wrong. They're prone to mistakes. They are um, not uh, going to provide Ronald Reagan's kind of Star Wars shield. But as they are being developed, they of course, you get this offense-defense spiral. So then we see increasing problems and, and insecurities uh, between various states in the region, and particularly China viewing the missile defense, the US missile defense um, in, um, in South Korea, and also the uh, increasing numbers of naval exercises, uh, military exercises going on, on in the South China Sea, the, um, some of the, of, 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 of the exercises and some of the discussions and negotiations with Japan. China sees those as potentially aimed at them. So does Russia, up to a point. Um, North Korea, of course, certainly does. So <clears throat> that's the, the, you know, those are, are, are really the, ch the challenges. And then you get a country like Japan, faced with nuclear ban treaty negotiations happening in the UN, and Hibakusha organizations who have collected now over a million and a half signatories, and they're still carrying on, calling on the government to be there. Japan was squeezed between a rock and a hard place because the US administration, and this predated Trump, so this part of it is not particularly a, a, a Trump aspect, he, he is carrying on with, first of all, trying to boycott these developments, then trying to block, then hoping to derail. None of those things have worked. The process has actually been gathering momentum. So Japan, so, so Nikki Haley, Trump's new um, ambassador in New York to the UN, she holds what she calls a media stakeout outside the UN General Assembly. Uh, she has France on one side, the UK uh, ambassador on the other, and a small gaggle, about 20 around. I, I think I definitely saw the South Korean. I don't know if it was the ambassador or, 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 or someone else from that delegation. But Japan wasn't there. Japan went into the General Assembly and gave a speech that, again, committed to <coughs> nuclear disarmament, but not yet. And then said it had to be done through the NPT but without acknowledging the ways in which the NPT is no longer fit by itself for the purpose. And having given its speech, Japan left its seat empty for the whole week of negotiations after that. But there were quite a lot of other Japanese speakers there, mostly from uh, the Hibakusha organizations and uh, civil society, mayors for peace, and so on. So, <clears throat> I'm going to throw out a few questions that I think are, are really going to need to be discussing because this nuclear ban treaty is going to be a reality. It is happening. By being done in the way it's being done under international humanitarian law and through UN General Assembly rules of procedure, it can be negotiated, concluded, and adopted by majority. It does not require consensus under UN rules of the Conference on Disarmament, which actually has only 66 members, requires consensus, which is one reason why it has not managed to negotiate anything since the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 1996. The um, Fissile Materials Treaty, they adopted a mandate to negotiate, and then they got stuck. Because at least it, it just takes one nuclear armed state. In the CD's situation, it was mostly and usually Pakistan, but one nuclear armed state or one other state 
choosing to exercise a veto, and you couldn't get anywhere for, for two decades. But this treaty process has it's learned from those mistakes, and it was set up with, with the um, principles of open to all UN member states, but blockable by none. And I can tell you, almost twice the number of members of the Conference on Disarmament participated in the General Assembly um, uh, negotiations last week. 132 states participated. That's two-thirds of the UN. And Nikki Haley had about 21 around her declaring a boycott. And as far as we know, that number then, there were others like Germany, Belgium, Italy, Spain, um, Norway, who didn't want to embarrass themselves with a media stakeout outside the entrance of the UN General Assembly, because that looked like a sign of weakness, I can tell you. And I think the newspapers that covered it, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and so on, recognized it as a protest against the UN and not the, um, you know, not the mark of a, 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 a strong um, regime, a strong country. So, um, so, but those countries also left empty seats. But not all of NATO was in solidarity. So my questions here is, if the nuclear ban treaty is gonna happen, and the chair, who's the Costa Rican ambassador, Elaine White, actually wants to finish by the time of the second tranche of negotiations this year, which are due to conclude on the 7th of July. In between that, we will have another NPT meeting in Vienna from the 2nd to the 12th of May, and it'll be interesting to see how these things interface. But it will happen because the process now cannot be fully stopped or derailed. The question is how, who will sign it, but that's a different set of questions because the way the treaties work, they start to embed in international law and then civil society, where there is civil society, and other pressures start to act and it changes behavior. We've seen this with the landmines treaty, we've seen it with the chemical weapons treaty, we've seen it with the biological weapons treaty, we've seen it with the cluster munitions treaty. It starts to act even on the states that don't sign or are not ready to sign. Um, so, instead of trying to block, boycott, and derail, let's think about how having a nuclear ban treaty that certainly its proponents want to be something that strengthens and reinforces, that even protects and supports at least the disarmament and non-proliferation elements of the NPT regime, and also the CTBT, which has not yet entered into force, we're talking about a treaty intended to prohibit the use, and therefore threat of use, whether it's physically or by um, other legal means, but essentially the use, the threat of use, the deployment, the production and development, the uh, uh, transferring, the transporting, the stockpiling. Uh, whether it uses a word like possession is still up for grabs, but a lot of states want it to actually prohibit the possession of nuclear weapons except for the purposes of keeping them safe and secure pending their total elimination. And then it will need to have a positive obligation, a much clearer obligation than Article 6 of the, of the NPT, to eliminate, to totally eliminate arsenals. So how will that change things? How could Northeast Asia employ it as a new security tool you know, there's been talk about having a Northeast Asia nuclear weapon-free zone, but it can't take place in a vacuum for just the region because you've got three big players, China, Russia, um, and uh, the United States, that wouldn't be part of that zone, but obviously have massive impact on that zone. And so it's kind of difficult to imagine a, a zone only working to encompass North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and perhaps Taiwan. Um, so, but let's think about what security could look like. If you denuclearized the security alliances, how could you strengthen the US-Japanese alliance? How could you strengthen the US-Korean, South Korean alliance? How could you use a treaty like this to take away some of the value attached to nuclear weapons, not only 
by the US, Russia, China, but by North Korea too. How would you use it to erode what appears to be a high value asset for Kim Jong-un? Uh, what will be the interface between perceived national security interests and uh, the humanitarian regime building re uh, regional and international security interests? And I'll leave you there with those questions. Thank you very much.